My name is Andrew Pan, and I'm from HRL Laboratories in Malibu, California. And I'll be presenting the first of two connected talks regarding a simple but powerful technique we've been developing to study the excited state spectrum and quantum dots. Uh, this talk will focus on the interdot dynamics relevant to this method. And, the, uh, and I highly encourage you to check out my colleague Kate Rock's uh, talk entitled Post Spectroscopy of Silicon, Silicon Germanium Quantum Dots for more details on the experimental procedure and the uh, ex uh, experimental results and measurements in uh, silicon germanium quantum dots. So we're interested, of course, in the excited state spectrum of quantum dots because they're relevant for all aspects of qubit operation. Uh, in these talks, we'll mostly focus on the single electron spectrum, um, although the method that we describe generalizes equally well to the multi-electron regime. In the single electron uh, regime, uh, of course, there are orbital excitations in general, which are very sensitive functions of the, of the electrostatic confinement that the dot feels. And there are also valley excited states due to the um, conduction band structure of silicon, uh, which, uh, whose energetics are very sensitive features of the quantum wall interface that the electron may sample. And so in general, we expect the excited states, whether valley, orbit, or some hybridized uh, mixture of those, to be quite sensitive functions of the uh, device tune-up. As a result, for uh, devices with multiple quantum dots, we'd like to be able to measure the spectra in conditions as close to their final operating conditions as possible. Now, over the years, of course, many uh, techniques have been proposed to study the excited state spectrum in quantum dots. I'm not going to go into uh, all these methods in detail, but uh, I would just mention that most, many or most of these techniques rely on having the electron immediately adjacent to a bath, uh, electron bath, uh, or they may have restrictions on the magnitude or the type or number of excitations which can be measured. And so uh, if we'd like to measure arbitrary excited states, uh, in uh, larger dot devices, we want to uh, aim for a more generalizable technique. Um, as an example of what we're looking for, we can consider how interdot transitions occur, for instance, in an isolated double quantum dot. Here, we expect that as we change the tuning, we should see level crossings between excited states in different dots. Now, um, if we can observe charge transitions at these level crossings, then from the detuning uh, differences of these anti-crossings, we can infer what the energy splittings are. So one way, of course, to try to observe these transitions is to rely on coherent tunneling. And this boils down essentially to using uh, landau zener type uh, transitions, which uh, we can observe by changing detuning uh, uh, across these different uh, level crossings. One of the um, difficulties here practically, however, is because landau zener is such a sensitive function of the actual tunnel couplings uh, uh, and the uh, ramp dynamics, uh, trying to use this technique to determine you know, multiple anticrossings at undetermined locations in detuning space, uh, where each anticrossing could in principle have, for instance, a different tunnel coupling due to valley phase differences or orbital overlaps of different excited states. Uh, is a very convoluted process. And so instead, we'll, we will focus on the opposite regime of incoherent dynamics uh, and low tunnel coupling, uh, where we don't have to optimize uh, the coherent features, but we're just relying on the uh, uh, incoherent charge, the K rates, to single out the transitions that we care about. So the overall procedure that we, uh, that we uh, are interested in is to essentially prepare an electron in the ground state of a quantum dot uh, and then change uh, diabatically the detuning uh, across the charge cell boundary and, and as a function of this detuning uh, observe how the charge decay rate um, how the charge decay uh, uh, rate changes as a function of detuning. Uh, in this case uh, uh, in this case, uh, what we're hoping for is to observe uh, f uh, resonances essentially in the decay rate at these anticrossings from which we can infer the energy splittings. Now, in order to uh, resolve these features well, we want to understand what the uh, incoherent dynamics are likely to be in this regime. And that will be the focus of uh, the modeling discussed here. 
Now, it turns out most of the key features can be understood from a simple two-level model describing uh, um, a double dot in the vicinity of an anti-crossing between uh, two, two states on either side of the dot. Here, there will be some tunnel coupling, of course, between these charge states, as well as dephasing in the charge state basis and uh, potentially inelastic decay mechanisms, uh, which can also introduce uh, charge state transitions. Um, if we focus first on the uh, dephasing dynamics and ignore the inelastic uh, processes for a moment, uh, we can see that in the low tunnel coupling regime where we hope to operate, uh, where uh, charge noise dephasing dominates, uh, we expect to see uh, dephasing into a 50-50 charge state, which occurs at a rate roughly given by the uh, equation uh, up here, which scales with tunnel coupling squared and critically ha uh, reaches a peak uh, at zero detuning, essentially uh, right at the anti-crossing of the excited state. So this is, of course, exactly what we're looking for because it suggests we can have a, a re incoherent resonance at uh, each anti-crossing from which we can determine the energy splittings. Now the question, of course, is how do the inelastic thermalizing processes play a role here, since they may also be functions of tunnel coupling and detuning, and they might wash out these transitions in principle. So, of course, there are any number of microscopic uh, pathways for uh, thermalization. Uh, Co-tunneling is one, but that's something that we can typically experimentally control by turning off the bath tunneling rate. Uh, more mi fundamental processes can occur through, uh, for instance, acoustic phonon emission or interaction with electromagnetic interactions in electrons in the gates uh, or nearing uh, 2D electron gas. Um, most of these interactions scale with uh, the charge multiple uh, uh, matrix elements, which uh, scale essentially with the tunnel coupling uh, in a similar way to the uh, resonant transitions that we talked about earlier. Uh, and so if we uh, compute the microscopic dependencies of these rates on detuning, we observe something like this, where as small detunings, the relaxation is expected to be uh, controlled by uh, electromagnetic interactions, and that tends to fall off as uh, you increase your energy or your detuning. And at higher detunings, you become limited by phonon, uh, by the phonon energy, uh, uh, phonon decay, uh, which provides a relatively smooth uh, uh, dependence. And so the good news here is that, that we don't expect to see drastic enhancements in the decay rate uh, as a function of detuning, at least within those kinds of energy ranges that we're typically interested uh, in measuring, uh, uh, for measuring excited states. So if we put uh, these ingredients together, we can kind of predict how we expect the, kind, the, the type of uh, experiment that we hope to perform, uh, how that would behave. And uh, what we're modeling here is essentially a three-level system and probing the charge, uh, the charge, uh, pop, uh, charge redistribution in a double dot as we change the detuning to bring the uh, electron on one side of the dot, uh, one side of the double dot in resonance with uh, uh, either a ground or excited state in the other dot. Accounting for all these inelastic mechanisms as well as the uh, uh, charge, uh, charge basis dephasing. And so what we observe are peaks uh, which correspond to these resonances, uh, from, uh, which is, of course, exactly what we're looking for. And then we observe slower decay uh, um, away from these resonances due to these thermalizing processes. Uh, one of the features we can observe is that uh, as we wait for longer times at particular detuning, the locations of these peaks will shift. And in general, this is due to the, uh, the detuning de de dependence of the inelastic decay processes at play in this experiment. Um, this suggests, of course, that if we want to measure the, uh, the splittings accurately, we want to uh, look for peaks at uh, shorter uh, uh, hold times, uh, although, uh, which has the disadvantage, of course, of a smaller signal, but provides a more accurate measure of the excited state splitting. Uh, for, uh, for most of the decay that we observe as a function of detuning is single exponential, as one might expect. Interestingly, uh, at the excited state anticrossings, we tend to observe in modeling uh, bi exponential decays, which arise from this competition between uh, dephasing and thermalizing effects. And of course, the uh, overall features qualitatively extend to the uh, uh, case of multiple excited states, uh, for instance, with multiple orbital value or orbital states that we might want to probe in a dot. 
So to kind of uh, validate this modeling, we, we can look at the results of a similar dynamic experiment and an actual silicon germanium dot. And what we see here is, uh, again, as a function of detuning the whole time, very similar uh, features qualitatively to those predicted in modeling. For more details on this type of experiment and analysis on splittings, I, I again refer you to my colleague Kate Rock's talk. Uh, but uh, here I'll just uh, mention a few of the interesting features in the dynamics that we observe here. Uh, as noted before, we observe peaks corresponding to uh, what we believe are the ground and valley excited state in this dot. And we also observe that these peaks uh, have different uh, decay times on resonance, which suggests that they have different tunnel couplings uh, and it's possibly indicative of valley phase difference, uh, of a valley phase difference in this double dot. Uh, we also observe that you know, for longer hold times, the peaks tend to shift in energy uh, due, uh, due to these uh, inelastic decay mechanisms. And we observe, uh, furthermore, that at the excited state uh, anti-crossing, a bi-exponential decay appears uh, uh, as opposed to the single exponential decay we typically observe elsewhere. One thing to note is that in some uh, of our measurements, we've also observed bi-exponential decay at the ground state anticrossing, which remains a subject of uh, investigation. Finally, if we look at the uh, charge decay rates as a function of detuning extracted from these measurements, we observe qualitative agreement with uh, what is predicted by uh, uh, in theory, although we observe a 1 over detuning squared energy dependence rather than 1 over detuning dependence at low energies. And the microscopic uh, implications of this uh, dependence, energy dependence is also under investigation. So to conclude, uh, I think we've talked about how from a theoretical perspective we expect that uh, using diabatic detuning sweeps in a low tunnel coupling limit can allow us to resolve excited states in uh, quantum dots. Uh, again, uh, for more information on actual measurements and results, please check out my colleague Kate Rock's talk uh, entitled Post Spectroscopy of Silicon Germanium Quantum Dots. I've also noted that even though uh, these features uh, in this incoherent limit are coming from a very simple uh, consideration of dephasing and uh, symbolizing processes, they really apply to a lot of different aspects of device operation, including spin readout. Uh, and for more on that, I recommend uh, that you check out my colleague Jacob Blumoff's talk entitled Quantifying High Fidelity State Preparation and Measurement in Triple Quantum Dot Qubits. Uh, finally, if you're uh, interested in knowing more about silicon germanium quantum dot uh, spin qubit performance, please check out talks by my colleagues uh, Bo Sun and Dave Barnes. Bo will be talking about a fascinating uh, dynamical decoupling sequence, which can be done using exchange-only qubits. And Dave will be talking about effects of post-distortion, how to correct for them in such qubits. Thank you for your attention.